So under think, how to give great feedback and increase learning and change is what we are going to try to do now. I think that's really the crux of everything. You want your people to do better, it's all there, right? How to give great feedback and increase learning and change. Increase learning and change. This is just what we are trying to do. All right. So I was very interested when I learned this. You know, if you get a colorblind person and you show them that picture and say, tell me how green are some of these chilies and how red are some of these chilies, the colorblind person will tell me they all look brown, but a more yellowish brown. You ask another colorblind person, he'll say, no, it's not that yellowish, it's more brownish than yellow. <laughs> You ask the third brown colorblind person, he said, no, no, y'all are both wrong. It's like really yellow. So what have we done now? We have asked three colorblind people to describe that. Even if we take everything that those colorblind people are saying and we put it onto a graph and we look at the average, they are still not going to tell us anything about that. Are y'all understanding that point? Did we understand? Can I have a show of hands? Did you understand that? Ahmed, good. So, if colorblind people cannot assess redness or greenness of a chili, if colorblind, if people are colorblind, they cannot assess the redness or greenness of the chili. So, therefore, what we call is the error of a colorblind person trying to assess this is not random, but it's predictable. It's not a random error, it's a predictable error saying your error is going to be, there is going to be an error. It's going to be wrong. Do you understand the difference between random error and predictable? Random is I try to do some, sometimes I get it right, sometimes I get it wrong, put that margin of error, you know. This is not that, this is predictable. There is going to be a mistake. A huge mistake because there is no clue. So more colorblind people also assessing will actually give us more wrong measurement. It won't, doesn't take us any closer to the truth. Alright? Understood so far? So when we average all of that, we still don't bring us greater to the truth. So what's the learning here? We are all colorblind when it comes to abstract attributes like assessing people's potential, strategic thinking, commitment, curiosity. No, that's the learning. It is coming from some research done by two Harvard professors. So, what does this mean? If the Dilruk is said, okay, assess someone on his potential, the way you assess him, and if I was to assess him, and if Irendra was to assess him, and if Shenal was to assess him, it's like four colorblind people trying to assess them. Because even if we have a definition saying potential is this, which is what the HR people now do, you have a definition of what is the competency and all of that. What it says is we cannot keep the definition of an abstract concept in mind and then assess somebody because our bias comes in there. Our experience comes in there. Uh, what, what we think of potential comes in. So I say, my potential is this, therefore you are, your potential is this. Are we understanding? So this really turns on its head. <laughs> Everything we are currently assessing in people. Because it says, four people assess. Wrong. And other thing is, now if Diluk is assessing me and says, Sanjeev, your potential is like this because your commitment is not good or whatever. I cannot recognize myself in what he is saying. Because in my mind, I am committed. <laughs> now Dilruk is saying, Sanjay, you are not committed. On a ranking of Z, 1 to 5, I give you a commitment of 2. Yeah, 5 is the highest. I, I can't recognize myself in that. Because in my mind, I am doing everything I need to do to be committed. In my mind, my mind I am committed. Does that make some sense to you? Now, get your, try to get your heads down this. This is really important because it actually changes a lot of the ways that we think. So, this is called the idiosyncratic rater effect. There's a name also. Idiosyncratic rater effect. And apparently, this has been proven by psychometric research for the last 40 years. <laughs> that is from the 80s. Although we have not really known it. <laughs> idiosyncratic rater effect. Because we cannot rate people uniformly on abstract concepts. Commitment is an abstract concept. Potential is an abstract concept. Did you achieve your sales target or not is not an abstract concept. That's very clear. So what is this idiosyncratic rater effect or IRE telling us? We are notoriously unreliable raters of others. Who is we? Human beings. 
we don't have the ability to hold a stable definition of an abstract quality in our mind like assertiveness and evaluate others and our evaluation is colored by our own experience our own understanding and our own bias so for example what is meant by good <laughs> what is lenient what is harsh what is arrogant it's only what i think it is isn't it <laughs> doesn't this throw a lot of things on its head hey, how on earth do we do this now no, don't worry there is a solution <laughs> there is a solution and more than 50% of the ratings we give people are affected by the idiosyncratic rater effect. So what is that saying? More than 50% of the ratings we give people are wrong. And this, when I, was, when I was reading up on this, I was thinking of, my gosh, all the mistakes I have made, a lot to do with this. All the mistakes I have made when I have given feedback to people and then wonder why they resist my feedback. <laughs> why they get very angry with me, why they get very upset with me. Is this? And it made a lot of sense. It made a lot of sense. Are you, did you understand what's happening here? At some level, can I see a show of hands? I think this is important. All right, because we're going to build on this. Okay, so that is why it's difficult to accept feedback. Because I can't recognize myself in the feedback. You're saying I'm bad, I can't, I'm, no, I'm not bad, I'm good. So our self-image is not matching the image that somebody else is now saying about me. It's like looking in the mirror and you can't recognize yourself. Because that's what somebody else is saying. So I think, I'm not lazy, I'm committed, I don't have a bad attitude, why is my boss saying I do? Because what I mean by bad attitude is not what the boss means as bad attitude. <laughs> you understand? Boss is saying you have a bad attitude because you came one minute late. I'm saying no, no, no. But you know, my attitude is great. I worked late last night. <laughs> So how do we give better feedback? This is the solution. Part of the solution. We'll be discussing the solution the rest of the day. Part of the solution. We don't tell them how good they are on assertiveness, for example. But we do tell them the impact that they are having on you. The impact they are having on others. See, that day, uh, Irendra, when you gave, when you told uh, uh, Danul, what to do, Danul later called me and said he couldn't understand really what you had said. Now, I'm not saying that your, 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 the way you said was unclear. I'm not saying your communication skills are lacking. I'm telling you the impact of what you said to Danul, the impact was he hadn't understood. I understand the difference. If I say, come on, Irendra, you have to improve your communication skills. Like, what? Here, hello there, I'm not going to tell you. Now, Irendra, why is that, Sanjeev? No, I think I can communicate. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying, Irendra, it seems like there is a little concern here that what you said yesterday to Danul, Danul didn't understand. He hadn't understood. Right? Now, that is feedback. That's fine. I'm telling him the impact of something he did. I don't understand the difference. I'm not saying you are like this. I think that is the key. It's not you are this. You are this. So let's stop saying the you are this, you are this, you are this, you are this. But let's more focus on the impact that people are having. And then ask them, what do you think you could do to help Danul understand more? Are you understanding the difference? So the what question? What do you think you could do to help Danul understand more? Then he might say, uh, maybe I should talk slower. Maybe I'm talking too fast. No, I'm not telling him that he's saying, which is where the learning occurs. Then I go to my next question. And what else? <laughs> and what else do you think you could do? Uh, maybe I should use smaller words. Maybe the words I'm using you know, are too big, too abstract. Now he's giving the ideas. And then I say, now if you, if you use smaller words, what do you think would happen with Danul? What do you think? Uh, maybe he might understand more. Okay, how do you think we can try this out? Or maybe I'll go and speak to him now and ask him something. And let's see. All right. Now do you think any of the conversation puts him on the defensive? Do you think any of the conversation we had so far puts Irendra on the defensive? No, I'm not accusing him of anything. But I think we are on the road to solving the problem. Now in this whole conversation, idiosyncratic rate, IRE, IRE didn't come into effect, didn't come into play. Because we didn't do any of that. 
Are we understanding? So I'm taking it slow because we need to understand this. What's happening here, right? So not how good they are, but the impact they're having. It's fine, it's absolutely fine, and we should do this to share your own feelings, reactions, and results. Instead of saying, your presentation was really boring. Rohan, which then is telling him, Rohan, your presentation was boring to everyone. You could say, Rohan, your presentation was boring to me. That's why. You understand the difference? I am sharing how you impacted me. I'm not saying you are a boring presenter. I'm saying your presentation was boring to me. Are you understand the difference? Share your own feelings. You know, you spoke for a long time, trying to, uh, you spoke for a long time at the sales meeting. And I felt you were trying to persuade your sales team to achieve the new target. But I must tell you, Sanjeev, I was seated in that meeting and if I was thinking if I was one of the sales people, you didn't really persuade me. I wasn't persuaded. So then I was, why? What happened? Why weren't you persuaded? What could I do to persuade you? Understand? See, none of the things I'm saying are attacking. So if you're not attacking, you don't have to defend. <laughs> it's saying, you know, this is how I felt. Because the other person can't argue with how I felt. How I felt is how I felt. How you feel is up to you. <laughs> like I said, Chanal, you should have been really excited at the program. Because I was. Chanal, no, but I wasn't. Then I have to ask him, why? <laughs> what could I have done to make it more exciting to you? But I can't argue with you. Say, Chana, come on, you should have been excited. I was excited. You should be excited. What's wrong with you? Then I can't, I can't do that. I, do you all understand? Do we understand, gentlemen, ladies? Yes. Sometimes uh, the person can go come and say, look, uh, I don't know about you, but others understood. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. You, you, you can do that. You get. Then I could ask him, what makes you say that? <laughs> I'm, I'm really happy that you feel that way. <laughs> it's a conversation. Yeah, it's a conversation. What makes you think that the others understood? Because, you're, again, what are you doing as the boss here? What are you doing as the boss? What's the one word you're doing as the boss here? And this, this is the whole thing, crux of a coaching conversation. What's the word? The first word that we discussed, start of yesterday. Curiosity and helping others, right? But he is curiosity. I, so if you say, say Sanjay, you didn't understand, but I, everybody else understood. Ah, that's really interesting. You're not under attack now saying, ah, I didn't understand. How can you say others didn't others understood? This is not right? Nah. No, I didn't understand. That's interesting. Uh, I'm curious. What makes you think the others understood? <laughs> because maybe you spoke to her and she said, I understood everything. Maybe you spoke to her, I answered. But sometimes even if you spoke to them and they said they understood, how do you know they actually understood? <laughs> so it's a, it's a dialogue, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a conversation, it's a dialogue. These are the two things that we do a lot, which we should stop doing. We should not tell them how we think they should perform. We should not tell them how we think they should improve. Tough one. Tough one. We should not tell them how they, we think they should perform. Now, this is not to say we don't give them targets. No. Your target is 20 million for the month. You have to achieve this 20 million. That's what we have agreed. But I'm not going to tell you, you have to be more disciplined to achieve it. <laughs> you have to be more punctual to achieve it. You have to be more committed to achieve it. That's not what I'm going to do. But we are going to have a discussion and see what do you think you can do to achieve this? <laughs> because again, otherwise we are going into abstract concepts saying you are not punctual, you are not disciplined, you are not disciplined enough. What is disciplined enough now? <laughs> Where is that on that scale? I understand it. This is a complete different shift of thinking. Well, as soon as I learned this, it was a complete different shift of thinking for me. So I'm, I'm, I'm now I might be jumping to a judgment here with you about you. But I'm thinking 
it could possibly be a complete shift of thinking for you as well. Is it? How many of you is, is it like turning things on its head? So interesting. So, there was a research done. Always interested when it's research uh, findings. Research done by a gang is Marcus Buckingham. So they got two groups of people. And one group of people, group one, what was discussed with them was the dreams that they have and how they can set about achieving these dreams. And what they found was, in that group one, what was activated was their parasympathetic nervous system. PNS. So your parasympathetic nervous system is what calms you down, brings cortisol down. It's the recovery part of the nervous system. So we get stressed out, then we recover. Stressed out, recover. So PNS is good. PNS sounds like parents sons, no? <laughs> PNS is good because, because that calms us down. It opens up a lot of place of learning and all of that. So with the parasympathetic nervous system opening, what were the feelings and functions the group one had? Highly, highly motivated, strong emotions. Their well-being increased, their immunity increases. All right, what happened? It stimulates something called neurogenesis. Ah, neurogenesis is the birth of new nerve cells, neurons. Stimulates neurogenesis, genesis, birth, neuro, neurons. By the way, that's another learning there. Conventional thinking says, or learning says that as we grow older, our brain cells die and we don't get new brain cells. The first part is true, as we grow older, new brain cells die. But, if you do certain things, you can still continue neurogenesis. And that's good news. Because if neurogenesis is happening, there's chances of Alzheimer's happening. This is good news for all of us, right? So how do you stimulate neurogenesis? One is, the more you learn, the more you read, the more you're applying what you're learning and reading, your brain says, ah, let me grow some more because this person is trying to do new things. So, let's grow. So, for example, if you have never played a musical instrument, learn what? <laughs> if you have never gone for ballroom dancing, start. <laughs> and exercise. 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 Exercise stimulates neurogenesis because it, it grows something called BDNF. It's a, it's a hormone, it's a, it's a protein that is needed for new brain cells to grow. Needed for new brain cells to grow. So as that grows, then we can. And evokes cognitive, perceptual, and op emotional openness. Now, if you want someone to improve, isn't it better if they are strong motivated, if they have strong positive emotions, if they are feeling good, if they are feeling rested, if they are feeling uh, uh, emotionally open to do anything? Isn't that better? <laughs> You can talk and get a better result. Group two. What was this? This was a group of students. So group two was taught, uh, brought and asked them, okay, what did, what did you do for homework? How many, how many answers wrong? How am I going to correct this? You should study more. <laughs> and what happened with them was, their sympathetic nervous system got activated, which is their stress level went up. So sympathetic is activated when the lion is chasing you. Okay. Sympathetic went up. They were stressed, strong negative emotions, immunity dropped. <laughs> they cannot access existing neural networks, which means they cannot learn. So when someone is in a state of stress, no matter how much you are telling them, and how much you are telling them do things differently, learn this new thing, they can't learn. Because the mind is closed. Closed in not by their choice. Maybe they want to learn. But because stress levels are high, you can't learn. <laughs> let, me, let me prove that point to you. So, how many of you have experienced going for an exam, being quite worried whether you have studied enough and whether you know you'll be able to answer all the questions? How many of you have been in that position? Yes, I, yes, we have all been there. So you're stressed out. How many of you experienced you go now, you sit at the exam hall, you get the paper, 
you look at the paper and you realize, my gosh, I knew the answer to this question yesterday, but for the life of me, I cannot remember it now. How many? All of us. Now, what happens after the exam is over? You finish, you never got the answer for that because you couldn't remember. You go to the garden, you talk to your friends, you have a cup of tea. Do you remember the answer now? Yes. That is because of that. So when stress increases, cortisol levels increase. I'm telling you the neurological and biological thing here. Cortisol increases. As soon as cortisol increases, there's a part of your brain called the hippocampus. Hippocampus is responsible for memory retention and memory retrieval. So when you are trying to learn, if stress is high, you can't put what you are learning into the hippocampus, which means you can't store it. All right, got that? Whatever you have learned, if you are trying to get it out now to write the answer, or because your boss is asking you what, what that figure was or whatever, if at that point you are stressed out, you know it's there, but you can't remember it, because again, hippocampus is not working. Because as soon as cortisol goes up, hippocampus goes away. Is that making sense? That is why you didn't remember the answer at the exam, and remember it after. <laughs> So if, what's the, what's, the, what's the learning from this? If you want to help someone improve and learn, when you are trying to help that person, they should not be stressed out. I think that's the bottom line. That's the learning. If you want to help someone improve and learn, at the time you are trying to talk to them, you are trying to help them, you are trying to show them how to learn, if their stress levels are high, if they are anxious, if they are worried, they cannot learn, even if they want to. All right? And as underlying that research, is another research by Richard Boyasis, we saw the guy face, face, face yesterday, focusing people on their shortcomings or gaps does not enable learning, but impairs it. Focusing people on their shortcomings or gaps does not enable learning, but on the other hand, restricts, impairs it. So, that is all about new ways of thinking about giving feedback, or talking to someone or trying to help your team. What's our main role as a leader? Help my team member to succeed. In order to do that, we have to talk to them, obviously. If when I talk to my team, it makes matters worse, <laughs> I should probably jump in the well or something because I'm not helping. So let's learn how to do that so that we can do it in a way that actually helps. Would that make sense to you? There are two types of stress. There is something called eustress and distress. <laughs> okay? So distress is, I can't do it. You're scolding me. I'm so scared. I don't know what to do. <laughs> distress. So everyone there, distress. Eustress is the good stress you're talking about. Let's take an example. Anyone doing sales here? Lovely people doing sales. Yay! Okay, Akhil, you don't have to tell me the truth, but give me a ballpark. What's the sales target for the month? Yes. One billion? Yes. For the month? Yes. Yes. For the month? Yeah, yes. a billion for the month. Okay, Akhil, you need to give me some sales tips. I need to earn one billion a month. Can you help me? <laughs> okay, so one billion a month. Great. Now, if I am Hasit. <laughs> I give the example because she's a friend of mine and we can. So as it comes to Akila, I said, Akila, last month you achieved 1 million. Very good. Next month, Inang, 2 million a month. Akila, 2 million a month. Can you do it? Now you stress the distress. Come on again. Distress. Distress. <laughs> All right, now that's one response, all right? Okay, if I come to Akila and say, Akila, I did this market study. I found that there are more gaps in the market, here are the gaps. I want to try and hit two million, two billion. Akila, you're the only guy in this company who can do this. I know you can do this. I will help you. Shall we work together? Shall we try to do this? It will be a landmark thing. No one in the history of Haley's has achieved two billion a month. Akila, shall you and I, shall we create history? You 
you understand the difference same thing same target so what's the thing here it's not whether you go here or here depends on one thing what's the word starts with p no before positive perception how am i looking at the target you don't understand how am i looking at it if i am looking at it as a challenge ah let's get there use this so i still get pumped up adrenaline is going a little bit of cortisol also good because i think i can i want to do it i am challenged i am empowered i am motivated i am driven yes uh sorry uh, you got some difference same target is my person idiot how can i do this boss is giving me this target to get me to resign because he knows for sure i cannot do it no one has done this it's an impossible target he is an idiot let me just just do something i don't like and now what happens he won't even achieve the one billion because he is not even trying he has given up and that's the difference are you understanding so that's why sometimes we say stress is good it's the useless and the useless is purely based on perception now if, if you tell someone you have to come and talk to a group of 80 people for two days and we i ask you how many of you will get useless how many of you will be distressed <laughs> it's true right sometimes you are told you have to make a board presentation and it's not useless it's the distress oh my gosh what are you doing but for me if you are told you have to speak to 1000 people it will be a lot of useless i will be like wow awesome give me that opportunity so it's not really the experience or the circumstance it's how we look at it now we went to malaysia pre covid and the entire family wife two boys the other family went with the wife to one girl one boy everybody really excited about going on the roller coaster because for them that was useless for me that's the highest form of distress <laughs> so very stress right so me and the other other gentleman in the in the group yeah the my my friend the husband of the other group both of us went to the zoo <laughs> and literally walked around holy lands while we did hold hands literally right <laughs> why the children and the wives were on the roller coaster nothing wrong with the roller coaster how i am perceiving it it's not my idea of fun <laughs> i understand it distress useless i love to perform and put me on top of the stage and that's that's like my my comfort zone but some other stage it'll be a different would be in a swimming pool i would like distress <laughs> <laughs> As you probably have realized, I'm not the most, you know, active sporty, but active, but not the most, you know, athletic that type of person. That's fine. That's just a choice. Try to answer your question. Did you get this point? So whether someone is under useless or distress, the game is you. How are you putting it across? That's it. So the Aziz put it put it across. Useless or distress? <laughs> Distress, <laughs> as useless also, right? I do that. Otherwise, if it's distress, you all won't be the way you are now. See that here. I can see you all are relaxed. You are smiling. You are energized. Which is it's more useless. Let's move on. Get into excellence. How do we get people to excellence? How do we get people to excellence? Which is what we want, right? We want. How do we help our people? to give the best of themselves to do the best work and as you are discussing a lot of that is about us how do we talk to them so one of the learnings is studying failure doesn't get us to excellence i let that sink in studying failure will help us stop failure but not move to success If you all are familiar with uh, Herzberg's theory, Herzberg's theory of motivation. If you are dissatisfied, 
by reducing dissatisfaction doesn't bring you to satisfaction. It just brings you to a state where you're no longer dissatisfied. Neutral. Now from there you need to help them now to be satisfied. <laughs> it's like if I take away your salary, you're going to be dissatisfied. Correct? But giving you your salary, salary won't make you satisfied. Because that's a norm. You expect it anyway. Are you all understanding? So come in, come into Jaik, right? Just because there is AC and there is a table and chairs and you get lunch, that doesn't make you motivated. Because that's a norm, you expect that. <laughs> but if it's not there, you'll be very upset. Are you seeing the reverse? So studying failure won't help us get to success. For example, the more we study why divorces happen, doesn't tell us anything about how to have a happy marriage. <laughs> studying at an exit interview, we do this, right? Exit interview, you ask people, why are you leaving? What makes you leave? But that doesn't tell us anything about why some people are not leaving and staying? <laughs> you, see, you see the difference? So it tells us, okay, why people are leaving. But it doesn't say, okay, so Darian has been here for 15 years. Why is he not going? And he's doing great work. So not that he's just staying there and getting his salary. He's not doing great work. Why? What's happening there? Studying depression doesn't tell us anything about how to be happy. <laughs> just how to be less depressed. <laughs> I understand it. So studying failure doesn't take us to success. Fixing a grammar in an essay will give us a grammatically correct essay, but may not get an essay that is fantastic. <laughs> it's grammatically correct, but does it do the job? Does it get you to act? We may not. <laughs> Full stop. <laughs> so another example, if you show a teacher when students lost interest and show what to do to fix it. So the teacher can now learn, okay, how to wake up a student if they are falling asleep, but not how to inspire the students to learn. Well, that's... A different thing. So hopefully you all are getting that. However, excellence and failure have a lot in common. Excellence and failure have a lot in common. So if you say, if you do a study of bad leaders, bad leaders, and you see what are the characteristics of a bad leader, and you see, okay, bad leaders have big egos. All right. With me so far? You see, bad leaders have big egos. So now we tell, at a leadership training program, I come and say, guys, bad leaders have big egos, so if you want to be a good leader, you should not have an ego. Now, would that help you become a leader? No. Because when you go and study good leaders, you find they have big egos also. You get understand the point. So some, some of the best, best leaders, leaders, most inspirational leaders, have huge egos. Because they think, wow, I'm good. I can inspire you. And isn't that why we get inspired? <laughs> so studying failure doesn't get us to excellence. Another example, you study bad sales people and say, you know, if you're a sales guy, you can't take rejection personally. If somebody refuses the sale, you just need to move on to the next one. So if you're getting upset when someone rejects, you're not a good sales guy. But then you study the best sales guys, they also get upset. Because they are personally invested. They feel the product is good. And they get very upset when somebody doesn't, you know, believe what they are saying. And that's what makes them a good salesman. Again, studying failure doesn't get us to excellence. Did you understand that? Guys, is that a good idea? Studying failure doesn't get us to excellence. Quick, talk quick. High five, high five, high five. Hey. Right up. <laughs> Studying failure doesn't get us to success. So there's a lovely story here about an American football coach called uh, Thomas Landry. So Landry was the coach of this uh, team called the Dallas Cowboys. And when he joined them as the coach, they had been like losing, 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 losing. Okay, then after he took over the, as the coach, in his first season also they won no games, lost 11, tied 1. And for the next four years also they lost matches, they lost the seasons. Okay? After that, they won for 20 consecutive years. They won for 20 consecutive years. 
That's the point. So uh, this group, but uh, Fenton was telling me, that before the current MB took over, they were making losses. Uh, the first year he was there, 764 million loss, something like that. Compared to 764 million loss. And in the first year, he, they brought it to profit. And now they're like going for like 3 billion profit or something like that. Like Thomas Landry, right? So, that is how I said, what did he do? What did he do? What did he do? He got them to focus on what they are doing well rather than the mistakes. So what he, what he found is there are thousands of ways or unlimited numbers of ways that you can mess things up. So what he, what he helped the, the players to see is the moments that they played well or they were successful or they scored a try, I don't know what to call it in this, probably a try or whatever it is. He showed them recordings of those moments and got them to figure out what did they do there <coughs> to be successful? When you focus on your successes, is your parano sympathetic nervous system or sympathetic nervous system active? PNS. Because that calms you down. That makes you like, like energized, happy, motivated, and all of that. He's helping them that way. You focus on people's mistakes, you take them the other way. So that is what he says was his secret. He got them focused on what they did right and then said, repeat that. <laughs> Focus on what you did right, amplify that. Are you understanding? So you take someone like me <laughs> and let's say Sanjay wants to be a star cricketer. All right. Now let's say that becomes my goal, my dream, my vision. I go for cricket practices, go, 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 play, play, play every day. Will I become better as a cricketer? Come on, look at me and don't, 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 like, give me some bad feedback. Would I become better as, how many things I will be better as a cricketer? Better, better, better. From where I am, will I improve? From where I am, will I improve? No, if I am here, will I improve at least up to here? Will I improve? Yes. Do you understand? Like, I'm not great at all at cricket. But if I go for practices and I'm committed, I practice, I do all of that. Will I improve? Show of hands, can I have a show? Will I improve? Yes, I will be better than I was. But I will never be a star. I will never, you know, represent Sri Lanka or something, right? Unless I have a lot of money or, you know, but I will. No. I, I, will, I will not be able to, you know, even play for a school team. So I was such a good cricketer that whenever I was like somehow roped into a match at, at school and you know, there's no one there, we need 11 people, there's only 10 Sanji in and uh, I would go and promise you, I would, while feeling, I would be praying that the ball doesn't come in my direction. <laughs> because I knew if it came, I'm going to drop the catch. And that would be embarrassing. So please, ball, don't come to me. It would be my only, uh, only prayer. That's what I would be better. But as a, as a presenter, as a trainer, if I continue to do more on this time of the work, I continue to invest my time in this, I continue to learn, I continue to grow, I can get higher and higher and higher and higher and get to whatever level I want to. Do you understand the difference? So, I have to focus on what my strengths are and improve my strengths because then I can get higher and higher on my strengths. Focusing on what my weaknesses are and trying to improve those will only get me to a certain place. Are you understanding? So today Anusha and I were discussing on the way here about putting a square peg into a triangular hole and trying to force that square peg into the triangle doesn't work. So how what is going to do it? Say you have someone in your team, good person, highly committed, but you're not getting the result you want to the extent you want. Could it be the person is in the wrong role? Do you have a sales guy who is not comfortable talking to people? What do you think? Achieve the target, achieve the target. That is very good at data analysis. You put the person to data analysis, fantastic. So could you switch? Are you understanding? Square peg in the triangular hole or the circle? So Landry. 
So, get into excellence. A few practical things we can do. Always look for practical things. Our, our gut feel and our natural tendency is to pounce when we see failure. If I see Venura doing something wrong, my natural tendency is pounce. Venura, I saw that. Why did you do that? Can we stop doing that, but instead pounce on success? As soon as you see someone doing something right, Shannon, Shannon, I saw that. Wonderful. Great. Are you understanding? So, can you bring success or looking for success or identifying success or appreciating success? Or celebrating success into the process. Now, listen carefully. Can you bring identifying, appreciating, celebrating success into your process? Because then it will happen. If you leave it to chance to say, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whenever I remember, I will appreciate people. It may happen, but mostly it may not happen, right? Because we are wired to look for the mistakes. Why are we wired, why are we wired for, uh, to look for the mistakes? Amangi, yes. Amangi. Why are we wired to look for the mistakes? Survival. Because we are always thinking it could be a threat to me, a threat to me, a threat to me, a threat to me. Yeah, so, so defensive mode. So I am I'm always, always, remember Bane is scanning for danger every five seconds? Is that a threat? Is that a threat? Is that... So that's, that's why we are ready to pounce on failure. Because let's say Achilles is having his sales team of, I don't know how to say, 100 or something. If you see a mistake one of those guys is doing, you are thinking danger because I won't be able to achieve my one million. <laughs> if I don't achieve, my job is at stake. As it is going to just scream at me about it. Therefore, you are, you are tuned for the danger. You are looking out, there is a the danger, there is a the danger. Is that making sense? So we are ready to pounce on people who make a mistake. And therefore, we don't appreciate the good things, the successes. It doesn't happen naturally. That's why I am saying build it into the process. So it happens. What do you do? Jump on channel, channel, I saw that. Awesome work. What just happened? What made you do that? I saw how happy that customer was. What did you tell the customer? Why am I doing that? Why am I doing that? I am reinforcing what happened. So Shanal internalizes it. Which means there is more chance that he is going to replicate that. Which means there are more incidences of success for us. For Shanal, for me. Are you, are you understanding? So when we highlight, we can refine it, we anchor it in that person's mind, this is what happened, and we recreate. This is learning. This is what is called learning. This is what is called learning. Are you all, are you all with me? This is what is called learning.